Good morning and welcome to today's 20 minute update, BCF's monthly series of live streams to give you an inside look at BCF, our initiatives and the work we're doing in Baltimore City, Baltimore County and the entire region. Thanks for joining us. I'm Andrew Waldman with BCF and with me today is Shanesha Sauls, BCF's president and CEO. So happy to have you here today, Shanesha. Uh, you're the first BCF CEO to be on the 20 minute update. So thank you. congratulations for that distinction. Um, before we get started, I just want to thank our Civic Leadership Fund donors for their support. Uh, because of Civic Leadership Fund, we can do these calls uh, and provide other resources like the 20 minute update to our donors. Okay, so today we're going to talk about BCF's strategic plan. Um, this is something that BCF's Board of Trustees and staff, staff has been working on for, I think we started maybe a year and a half ago. Sounds right. Um, and we're finally able to share what sort of the, uh, the broad overview of what's going to happen with our strategic plan. I wanted to just jump right into it. So. Shanesha, can you share with us the goals of the strategic plan? Absolutely. So, uh, Andrew, you and the audience may recall that uh, at the beginning of 2017, uh, the Board of Trustees uh, engaged in a fact-finding process to understand BCF's positioning um, in the community, among its donors, um, its grantees, um, and in the broader region, uh, and used the information from those focus groups to land on um, a strategic direction which it uh, passed in June 2017. Um, uh, among the many uh, findings from that particular undertaking is um, there was a real energy and a sense of urgency that we wanted to be more Im impactful and to do more. Uh, so if many of you will recall, our grant making, for example, focused really on two tracks, uh, neighborhoods on one track, uh, education on another track. And one of the questions that the strategic direction invited was whether or not there was an opportunity to work at the intersection and therefore to go deeper and to be more impactful. Uh, and so they left it to the new president, and here she sits, um, to work with the team and the community to finalize that direction into a plan. Uh, since starting on February 1st, just six months ago. Seems um, like just yesterday. Does it really? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I've been relearning Baltimore, understanding BCF's positioning, and taking every opportunity um, in my meetings, whether individual, with individuals and in large groups, to understand and relearn Baltimore, but also to really understand the strategic direction. And I've been floating pieces of the strategic direction in most of those conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, and so through those um, discussions internally and externally, we've really come up with three goals. The first is focused on donors. Um, broadly speaking, it's focused on donor engagement, sort of really engaging our donors and educating our donors around the potential and the needs in Baltimore um, and the other areas around expanding and diversifying the donor base. The second key goal is around community engagement. That's the second leg of the stool. Um, BCF is positioned um, as Balt the Baltimore Region's Community Foundation um, and as an organization that sits at the treetops, we're actually able to engage at every level uh, of the region. So we can engage as a guest, as a friend, as a thought partner. Um, at the grassroots level, we should be received also as a thought leader and a thought partner among grass tops, all the way at, um, up to um, our peers um, at the grass, uh, excuse me, at the treetops. And our role as a community foundation, because of our unique expertise, we can really bring our constituencies together around the issues that matter for Baltimore. And so goal two is really drilling down in, in the kinds of forums that allow us to do that. And the third goal, really quickly, I know that I'm um, exhausting yeah. my time, is focused on program, and program is our uh, our short term, um, our our, um, our uh, shorthand for uh, our grant making, and our grant making will focus specifically on um, deepening and broadening our work at the intersection of schools and neighborhoods. Great. Um, this question just came uh, came into my head from strategic plan to excuse me from strategic direction to strategic plan. Some some of our viewers may not. Be familiar with the difference between those two things can you just quickly explain to them what that is sure sure so the strategic direction outlined the three goals that we would focus on but the specific strategies the tactics the outcomes that we would expect as well as um, the implementation strategy that was to be determined by the strategic plan so um, our intention is to complete all of those activities mm -hmm. um, by the end of this year and in 2019 we will launch the strategic uh, we will implement the strategic plan where we've come to this point is we now have the, the specific strategies that we will focus on in the strategic um, uh, in the strategic uh, 
plan. So um, under donors, we have a specific set of strategies that we will be mm -hmm. undertaking in order to strengthen our engagement um, and to broaden our, our donor base, so on and so forth with goals two and goals three. Great. Um, I think most of our viewers are going to be most interested in our third goal um, about our program work. So I wanted to just drill down into each of the goals a little bit more, but start with the program, um, the program goal. Tell us a little bit more about this intersection of schools and neighborhoods. What does that, what does that actually mean? Yeah, so um, as I entered uh, BCF, um, and as someone who's been in Baltimore for quite some time, there is an energy within um, the community, within the organization, to be able to go broader. So I mentioned at the top of the discussion that under our previous strategic plan, we focus on neighborhoods along one track, and we focus on education along another. Um, some of you will recall that our neighborhood strategy was really focused on a target neighborhood strategy, with the exception of our small grants program that we give to, um, to, um, to local communities. Um, but our neighborhood development was really focused on two areas of Baltimore yeah. City. I think my sense is that in the last two or three years, there's a real energy for us to do more, and we want to do more. The question is, how do we apply our expertise? Um, how do we exp um, apply what we know about the community and our resources? somewhat limited in order to do more, but in a way that can still tell a story, right? And so I think the challenge that I walked into is how do we not um, limit ourselves by being too targeted, but we can be more ubiquitous. My challenge in um, turn, my caveat to the team, as I'm sure you've heard, um, Andrew, is that when you try to do everything, you end up doing nothing. So if we're going to be um, more broad and we want to be more ubiquitous, we have to do it in a way that tells a story about why we would be in certain places. And so that is sort of the energy in which we took up uh, the strategic plan and working at the intersection. So. Um, uh, what we did is we came up with these leverage opportunities and really through the conversations internally and externally we had to think about um, so conceivably there are 200 intersections of schools and neighborhoods in Baltimore City alone we cannot be in all of them mm -hmm. right but we want right. to be in more than just two or three so how do we defend or start to have a conversation about being in more and so what we've done is we've identified these leverage opportunities um, in order to define how we would undertake those activities Really quickly, um, it's about the existence of social capital. We want to see something already in the ecosystem that we can identify and define. It doesn't have to be very formal, but in some cases it will, as formal as a neighborhood association or CDC. In other cases, it could be as informal um, as a virtual listserv. It could be two or three blocks that are really strong and mag mighty that are really focused on neighborhood stabilization. It could be a group of parents that have said, look, we're here in Baltimore, we love city life, and we want to commit to our school. We're going to um, uh, convene a series of charrettes to get um, a strong, uh, a, a strong uh, group of parents that, that, who are willing to commit to their local school. It could be that simple. So that's the first. There has to be some kind of social infrastructure already there that we can leverage because we're not going to do it. We're going to leave it up to the community on the ground to do it. The second is um, um, the potential for co-investment. So BCF cannot do it alone. We need the, some combination of strong, focused, intentional, um, and uh, partnerships that are in it for the long haul, uh, from the public sector for sure, um, but um, in addition to the public sector, we also need private investment as well as other philanthropic partners to come in with us, right? So that we're not the only ones putting, um, uh, putting our uh, skin in the game. Now that doesn't, that isn't to say that we couldn't be the first, but we wouldn't be the only. We would invite our partners to really think about the energy in the in the area and to think about how we could be collaborative. Um, so that second is the, uh, the potential for co-investment. And then the third is what we call impact, potential for impact. And that really has to be a quantitative measure mm -hmm. of what we want to achieve. So I said previously, it's easy to go everywhere, right? You can spread your seeds all over and say that you did a little bit of something, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, you can't tell a story. And so this, um, this leverage area known as potential for impact is really about the quantitative metrics that we would expect to see. The beauty of it is that there's a flexibility in the plan where it doesn't have to be all of them. So essentially we have narrowed, in on about, narrowed down to about three. The first is neighborhood uh, stabilization metrics, which could be um, stabilizing or increasing housing values in the area. It could be a violence reduction, it could be violence reduction metrics. Uh, the other option for quantitative metrics in terms of, of impact is school enrollment. Um, um, a thriving city requires, among, everything, among many things, a thriving public school system, and we need our communities to embrace um, the schools and their, um, and their uh, footprint, and so that could be a metric that we could identify for a particular area. And the third, of course, certainly last but not least by any measure, is that uh, potential for improving academic incomes. 
uh, excuse me, outcomes. If we don't care about what happens to children, we're not asking the right questions. Yeah. So I want to back up a little bit and just, I'm, I'm wondering if our viewers would, would benefit from hearing not a specific example, but how, how some of this might work in practice. How do we, um, you already described how we might identify some of these areas for uh, where there's an intersection, but when it's on the ground, what do you envision this looking like? Right, absolutely. So there are going to be three, I'll give you an example of the kinds of things we might um, consider um, investing in, whether that's our grant making or our convening or our role as an aggregator. Um, and I'll also talk about sort of the three areas that we would invest in this intersection. So the first is we would invest in leadership. That includes both leadership in the schools and in the surrounding neighborhood. Leadership okay. isn't always positional. Um, so it could be the case, and it probably will be the case, that we will care a lot about um, the principal and the school, for example. Um, but we also will care about that group of neighborhood leaders, those parents who have shown non-positional leadership to step up um, to improve their community. So we're going to look at the investment of leadership both in the school and in the surrounding community. The second area um, that we would um, invest in is in infrastructure. When we talk about infrastructure, for the most part we're talking about assets, um, uh, physical assets, uh, parks, ball fields, etc. Um, the local theaters, art spaces, um, but we're also talking about what um, what I would describe as a social infrastructure, right? Mm. I mean, a, the power of a place is about its people and the ability of its people to connect one another to move the needle. And so in addition to thinking about um, physical places as assets, um, we would invest in a social infrastructure where we're thinking about the people and the talent there and how they connect to moving the community forward is also an infrastructural um, um, investment. And then the third is in partnerships. I've said this um, before and I'll say it again. Um, no one can do this work alone. Even if you could do it, why would you want to? It seems awfully boring. Uh, and so we would be investing in partnerships that again advance our goals in the way that we want them to be advanced, looking at strategic partners that align with our strategy um, and that demonstrate best practices. So those are sort of the three areas we would invest in in any of these communities. Um, the kinds of examples. Um, so in the other, the beauty of this is it gives us a level of flexibility. Um, one of the things that we learned um, in our speaking with, um, with focus groups um, early on and even in my conversations over the six, last six months is that we don't want to be too prescriptive. We also want to make sure that we're coming into a place as a partner, as a listener, so we're not defining how something is done. Um, the strategic plan lays out why we do what we do and what we fund. We leave it to the community partners to determine how to achieve it. Hmm. So that could mean that in one area of the city, the issue is simply thinking about the fact that there are a series of school closures that will require not only the loss of one school community, but also the creation and the merger of another. And so the work there for the community might be just to figure out two things. Number one, how do you create a new school community where everyone belongs? The second might be, what do we do with these empty buildings? Hmm. And how do we convene neighborhood leaders, public agencies, the private sectors, um, and um, members of the private sector and developers around a solution to turn what could potentially become blight into an asset? In another community, it could be something as, um, as significant as a ball field. So let's say that um, the, the question is, they're trying to find ways that children, um, young adults, young families can come together, um, and they want to do it around recreation. And they want help from BCF, not BCF alone, but others, um, to complete this picture where what we need is we need public spaces where people are converging um, in order to uh, give vibrancy to the community. Um, in another instance, excuse me, um, it could be um, around neighborhood stabilization strategies, specifically um, focused on crime reduction. And again, those would be strategies that the, na that the neighbors and the residents would um, determine in consultation with us and others, and we would be there to support. That's great. Um, some time ago in the, in the conversation, you mentioned our small grants program. I know there are a lot of folks, uh, neighborhood folks, who... Um, use the neighborhood grants program is that part of the strategic plan is it staying in place you know that's yes. a question people would like to know so yeah so um we've given it a lot of thought ultimately we've decided that it's going to stay in its place it's not going to be necessarily integrated in the strategic plan in the short term um that said what we have found is that the small neighborhood grants program or sort of the 
the beginnings of the seeds of building social capital. Hmm. So over the long term, what we would expect perhaps in the next iteration of the strategic plan is those, those areas that were uh, recipients of the small grants program may use those funds in, over the next couple of years to build social capital. Interesting. And then we can think about how we can integrate it in a future iteration of the plan. So almost like a, it's almost starting up these groups. That's interesting. Um, I want to just pause for a moment um, to ask if anyone who is listening um, on the conference call has a question for Shanesha. If you have a question, just hit star six on your phone right now and go ahead and ask it. And then after you're done asking the question, you can hit star six to go back into mute. Any questions? Okay, we did have a couple questions that have come in. Um, in a, on online actually. Um, and so before we go any further, I just want to ask, get a couple of these in. Um, the first question came from Facebook. Uh, this, this question is, what are some other areas of concern you've identified from focus groups? You mentioned talking with the community earlier. Um, so there's a real concern that if we go to, if we're too focused, um, we might end up missing opportunities. So we started this conversation around the intersection of schools and neighborhoods and looking at two markers um, that um, could be magnets for our investment. The first um, was the 21st century schools as an opportunity to best leverage public dollars and what we hope will become community energy mm -hmm. to recreate and revitalize not only what happens in the school buildings, which is absolutely important, but also what happens around it. Uh, the second was Judy Centers. So as uh, many of you know, uh, BCF was a leader um, in the proliferation of uh, Judy Centers in Baltimore City. We now have 11, and although we're no longer starting Judy Centers, um, those uh, catchment areas still exist, and there's a real commitment to thinking about um, the Judy Center strategy in the context of wraparound services for families of children zero to five. What can we do to um, do to do more in those particular communities? Um, and my conversations um, over the last couple of months, there were some concerns about er other areas of the city where personally I would want to be, and I think mm -hmm. our, um, our uh, community foundation wants to be, that they get left out. And it's another mm -hmm. example of their being left out. So we actually created another category, and that category is community anchored schools. Mm -hmm. And that's also in the strategic plan, where you don't have to be necessarily a 21st century school or a school with a Judy Center. But you could be a school that is able to demonstrate that there is social capital that's rallying around improving the conditions in the school and around the school. Those schools could be public schools. Those schools could also be parochial schools that are doing really great work for the students who need it and, um, and actually deserve it. Hmm. That's great. Um, another question uh, that came in from Facebook was, good morning. I'm feeling concerned about our schools and how we can best support our teachers and kids. I don't know if that's exactly a question, but um, I guess that sort of reiterates what we've been talking about here is there's a lot of people in the community that are very concerned about um, what's happening in Baltimore schools. Um, so, so I'm happy to respond to that just really quickly. Sure. So it's not yeah. a question. Um, so thank you for the comment. Um, I agree wholeheartedly. I think um, not only do we want to support what's happening in the schools, we won't be able to support every school, but supporting a really great leader um, in, uh, uh, in central office, uh, Dr. Santelisis and her work and um, advancing her vision, but also communicating to her what our vision is to grow the city. Um, and make this a school system that we can be proud of is also a part of the work. Um, sometimes that is being an agitator, but almost always that's also learning about how to talk together and work together, and we actually have a person in this school district who can do it. So thank you for your comment. Awesome. So we're almost out of time, but I, I want to get through the other two goals. Um, if we could just touch on them a little bit. Um, the goal about community engagement, you kind of laid it out a little bit, but just give us a quick... Um, a quick overview of, of our goal there and how that's already starting to, to play out. Right, so um, the way I've described this goal is that we are being uh, purposefully organic. Um, the community engagement goal is the one goal where we have to constantly remind ourselves that we don't know what we don't know. And so um, the community engagement part of the strategic plan is ongoing because we want to make sure that we are engaging people 
and conversations about how we best move Baltimore forward, but we're always acknowledging in the context of that conversation that we don't have all the answers and there might be relevant voices who we're leaving out. They're gonna help us think about this better. So at the end of every engagement, there's always the question, who needs to be here, who isn't here? And so that's sort of how we're designing it. So we're not being overly prescriptive. We sort of do these in sort of four to six week um, chunks. And then at the end of that series, we determine what the next series hmm. should look like based on what we learned. Um, we piloted um, in the month of June an open table, um, and we did a focus open table on education and a focus open table on neighborhoods. And Andrew, when I tell you that that was such a beautiful and almost accidental example of how we bring people together, who all have the same concerns but don't usually have an opportunity to talk to one another in a deep and thoughtful way, that would be it. So in addition to talking about the strategic plan in Baltimore, there was sort of this soft magic where people hmm. got to share their common concerns and kind of step outside of their silos. Um, and it was sort of a cathartic moment, I think, for everyone there. And we actually plan to continue this series throughout. Great. Um, we just got another question online here. I'm seeing, seeing if I can get it in real quick. Um, this is another program-related question. Uh, if we don't mind, go a couple, if we can go a couple minutes over sure. and get all these questions. And we don't you usually know, don't Andrew, have this many this questions. Case, you can tell me exactly what to do. <laughs> Great. Go okay, it. cool. It's my one chance. <laughs> all right. So this question comes from someone on Facebook, and it is, how is BCF supporting the Kerwin Commission findings? How are you advocating for race equity in our schools? Oh. That's two very large questions. But, yes, if but you these can... are important ones. So um, as you all recall, um, in the late fall, um, BCF took an important stand to change the conversation and to insert race equity into the conversations in the Kerwin Commission. And we're very pleased that not only did it take hold, people are starting to talk about it. So as most of you know, that starting a conversation is one thing, but the policy agenda is quite another. So we're very pleased that we started um, the conversation that this has sort of taken hold and people are really interested in it. Now we need to translate the issue into a policy agenda. So our team has actually been working on that very thing. We're looking at the research um, that we're required to implement it. And we're being really thoughtful about the players that we have at the table. We're talking to people at the national level and also people at the local level so that we can engage stakeholders, but most importantly, our leg legislators to make sure they're well-educated, they're well-informed so that we can have an intelligent agenda to move these questions forward. So I'm really excited about it. About it. It's still in process. Um, what was the other part of the question? The other part of the question was, how are you advocating for race equity in our schools? Our schools. So, so um, right now we're focusing our advocacy on the state level. We're not focusing it on the local level. We're working in partnership with the district, which, which also has a race equity uh, blend in its approach, um, not only to um, uh, the Kerwin funding formula, but there's some things that the school system is working on generally. So we're more so working as a thought partner. Our Got focus it. right now is on state policy questions. Great. Um, and we think that's probably the best role that we serve right now. Sure. Yeah, and I think um, in the future, we're probably going to have a couple more 20-minute updates that talk specifically about Kerwin. So if you're interested in that, yes. you can definitely tune in for those. Um, okay, really quick. Uh, the donor goal. Mm -hmm. If you could just give us the top line on that. Top line. That's a big thing BCF does is we uh, raise uh, resources to increase our reach. So how are we improving in that top area? Top line, we're going to educate our donors because they want to know about Baltimore. They count on uh, BCF to give them the knowledge. And not only are we helping them to advance their philanthropic goals, we're um, allowing them an opportunity to direct their philanthropy to um, meet the potential and the needs in Baltimore. That's the first. And the second, we're going to change the, um, the traditional definition of philanthropy because um, our demographics are changing. Um, we have fourth generation, fifth generation who do not think about philanthropy in the same way that their parents and grandparents do. Mm -hmm. We have transplants who are coming here from other areas who need to be tied into Baltimore and they need to connect with the term of philanthropy, although by all stretches of the imagination, they're philanthropic, they like to volunteer, sure. they care about the community around them, and we really haven't latched onto the opportunity and the uh, strategic plan is going to tee us up to do so. Great. Okay, well, we've gone a couple minutes over. I um, want to thank you again, Shanesha, for joining us on this call. I'm sure that there are some folks that didn't get to ask a question that may have a question. You can always email us questions at bcf at bcf.org, um, and we can try to have Shanesha maybe do some... We'll see. Yeah, but, uh, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. We'll, uh, <laughs> we'll see if we can answer your questions yes. there um, about the strategic plan. Um, once again, thanks to our Civic Leadership Fund donors for making all of this possible. Um, 
As always, you can subscribe to our e-news at bcf.org slash e-news. And we will not be having a 20-minute update in August. We'll be back on September 20th at 9 a.m. for our next call. Thanks so much and enjoy the rest of the summer. Thank you.